This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your house. Go to ring.com slash knowhow and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security Kit with their limited time offer. Today on Know How, the latest in portable computing. Welcome to Know How. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit. Unfortunately, my co-host is not here today. That's right, folks. The cranky hippo is sick. He's actually deathly ill after sacrificing himself to save the uh, entire Twit crew from... Like some of those places out the coast, there isn't a Wi-Fi connection that you can connect to. Yeah, exactly. See, he's a t hip -hip hippo is always here in spirit, and uh, he'll be back. No, actually, folks, he, he really did get ill. And uh, we, we wish him a speedy recovery. The show's just not the same without him. Oh, you may have noticed this, the latest and the greatest in portable computing technology. Actually, no, this is not the latest and greatest. Actually, Alex, what, what is this? What model this is, is this? It's a Macintosh portable from 1989. Yeah, uh, now what I really love about this is uh, if, you, if you open this up, because you know these old models were really easy to open up, uh, you find the power source, and the power source is uh, actually right here. It's a nine volt battery. Can you go? Yeah, nine volt battery. These things are run on next to actually no. It's this big honking. It's a car battery, folks. This actually is a lead acid battery. If anybody actually has the operating specs on this, like how much voltage it's supposed to put out, because it puts out absolutely nothing right now, uh, it'd be nice. We're, we're going to try to rebuild this thing into something incredible. Actually, this is a, this is part of uh, a Nelf's. Mac Studio. Oh uh, no, folks, this is not the latest in portable technology. This was hiding Padre. the latest pa in portable Padre, technology. Use the handle when you're lifting it, please. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That's right, because it is a portable, right? It's got a handle. It's got a handle. That's. I mean, that's. Hold on, wait. It's like a. Uh, it's like a man purse. Wait. And and the handle conveniently acts as the uh, display ejection system as well. They don't build them like these anymore, folks, and that's mostly because they weigh about 40 pounds. <clears throat> All right. Let's actually talk about what we want to show off, and that's this. We did a first look at this two weeks ago. Greg Apo had the Swift 7, I had the Spin 7. We wanted to give it a little bit of time to marinate, because you know how we do reviews here at the Twit TV network. We don't just want to buy something and then tell you how it is after using it for five minutes. We've used these as our daily drivers for two weeks. This has replaced my stalwart S7. Now, this has been my favorite laptop for four years. I've never hold, held onto a laptop that long, and I've never really even felt seriously challenged to move to something else until I met the Spin 7. Here are my impressions of what Acer did with their latest and greatest in convertible Ultrabooks. The Spin 7 is the latest in convertibles from Acer. Measuring 0.43 inches thin and weighing 2.65 pounds, the all-aluminum unibody Spin 7 is lighter, thinner, and has a larger screen than Acer's previous flagship Ultrabook, the S7. In that small package, you get a lot. The Spin 7 sports a 14-inch 1920x1080 10-point multi-touch IPS screen under Gorilla Glass 4. It's powered by a 7th gen Intel i7 7Y75 processor running between 1.3 and 3.6 GHz and 8 GB of LPDDR3 memory. An upgradable 256GB Kingston MSAT SSD provides storage and a wireless module adds dual-band 802.11 AGBN 2x2 multi-user AC MIMO and Bluetooth 4.1 connectivity. Along the left side of the Spin 7 you'll find a lock port, a power switch, and a volume rocker. On the right side are two USB-C ports and a combo audio jack. There was talk about being brave and removing the audio port, but the Acer engineers laughed off that suggestion because, well, it was just silly. In benchmarks, the Spin 7 handles itself quite well. It's not a gaming machine, but it still managed to average 2540 in PC Mark 8, 4800 in CloudGate, and 680 in Firestrike. The 4-cell 2.77 amp-hour lithium-ion battery lasted up to 9.5 hours, with a typical use rundown time of just over 7. Those are some pretty decent specs for a convertible that sells for under $1,200, but how does it feel? In a word? Om nom 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 nom. That's a, a word, right? But whatever, it, it's good. 
The keyboard has a surprising amount of travel and resistance. The keys are well spaced to avoid fat fingering and the oversized touchpad has excellent palm rejection. The all aluminum and Gorilla Glass construction looks stylish while being very functional and the screen has just the right levels of contrast, saturation and brightness. With just two USB-C ports to connect and power the unit, you're going to need some dongles. Luckily, Acer provides them in the box. The Spin 7 arrives with USB-C to HDMI and USB-C to USB-A dongles. One of the ports features DisplayPort over USB-C, so you can get truly lag-free 4K output on a monitor of your choice. Of course, as a convertible, the hinge is important. So many convertibles have fallen just short of great because their conversion mechanisms feel wrong. But Acer has been working on the tech for years, and it shows. The Spin 7 utilizes Acer's proprietary variable resistance 360 degree hinge that easily opens, holds, folds, and maintains the screen exactly where you want it. Not only that, but they've done a phenomenal job in balancing the Spin 7. It never feels as if the screen will pull over the keyboard, nor does the keyboard feel like dead weight when the Spin 7 is in tablet mode. It automatically transitions between laptop and tablet mode, rotating its display properly and shutting off the keyboard and mouse inputs when in tablet or stand mode. Audio is actually quite good for such a small notebook. Acer built Dolby sound enhancements into the Spin 7 and added a neat bit of tech with a feature that automatically flips audio output when the display is reversed. In all, the Spin 7 is an almost note-perfect convertible in terms of price, performance, design, construction, and feature set. This is not an Ultrabook with a tabletable screen, nor a tablet with a tacked-on keyboard and mouse. This is one of those very rare tablet Ultrabook convertibles that really feels at home playing either part. I've tested a lot of convertibles over the last couple of years, and I like them because I like what they do. But they've always been sort of that second-class laptop thing where, yes, you can use it as a convertible, but it's not a great tablet. And yes, you could use it as a laptop, but it's not a great laptop. Uh, you know, sort of the jack-of-all-trades, master of none. This is different. And I think that's the impression I got after a couple of uh, weeks of using it. It is light, like my Ultrabook. In fact, it's lighter than my Acer S7. It's got the styling of my Acer S7, and it doesn't feel like a bad laptop. The keyboard is actually very, very nice, probably nicer than the one on my S7. The touchpad is definitely nicer than the one on my S7. I, I like the stiffness of the chassis, this all aluminum construction. Not a big fan of this, this black aluminum because it tends to attract, let's see if I can get some of them. It tends to attract fingerprints like nobody's business, whereas the white surface of my S7, even if there are fingerprints, I can't see them. It's, you know, it's one of my OCD things. And yes, the convertible mode actually works. This, this does make sense. A lot of people will look at a convertible that's three pounds and they'll say, oh, it's, that's just a very heavy tablet. There is such a difference between three pounds and a 2.5 pound tablet. And that's what this gives you. And it gives you all the power of an i7 with eight gigabytes of memory and a really fast SSD. I'd say probably the only drawback for me of having this is the USB-C ports. And that's only because we haven't really adopted USB-C in MOS. There's so many of our peripherals that are USB-A, which is why it's nice that Acer did include those dongles. They've got one for HDMI and they've got one for USB. But with only two USB-C ports and with a lot of my peripherals still in the old style of USB, it means that I'm gonna be breaking out those dongles an awful lot until we go native. Still, I mean, for $1,200, for less than what I paid for my Acer S7, uh, this, this is a phenomenal choice. I mean, this is something that I can recommend to people who want a laptop maybe to play with a tablet or who want a tablet maybe sometimes to use as a laptop when they need to do a lot of typing. If you are looking for a buy, this is definitely the one that you're going to want to take a look at. Now, we did speak a tiny bit about uh, the problem with USB-C. You see, USB-C is nice, but what happens when you don't have a lot of USB peripherals? What happens when your USB-C stuff is kind of cordoned off from all the other things that you need to do to get through your daily computing life? Well, in the next segment, we're going to take a look at some of the vital pieces of equipment that you might want to put in your brand new Ultrabook kit. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank a sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, folks, I like our sponsors because our sponsors let us do what it is that we do here on Know How, but I like them even more when they're a sponsor that I purchased even before they became a sponsor on the network. That's exactly what we get 
with Ring.com. Now, you know Ring.com. If you've ever watched the TWIT TV network, you've seen Leo Laporte, myself, and, and all the hosts, Jason Howell, Megan Maroney, talk about the Ring system. This is what it looks like. You see, Ring is a system that replaces your current doorbell. Uh, that doesn't sound too sexy. I mean, yeah, doorbell is a doorbell. You, you close the circuit and the bell rings. But this adds smarts to your doorbell, essentially turning your house into a smart home. You see, the Ring Video Doorbell is this. It's got a little plate so you can mount it onto where your current doorbell exists, drawing current from the house to keep this charged. And it also has an internal lithium-ion battery so you can keep it charged for up to a year. But with that power, what it will do is it will connect to your Wi-Fi system so that you can see who's coming to your door. It has a motion detector plus a high-definition camera plus a microphone and a speaker so you can have a two-way conversation with whoever might be approaching your house even if you're half a planet away. Now, this is the one that I have installed at my family's home in Henderson. I was a little worried about my parents. They, they live in a, an older community, and, well, sometimes we get suspicious people coming up to the door. I wanted to make sure that they'd be safe, so I installed a ring video doorbell with my father. And the nice thing about this is, even if they're not home, they can answer the door. Even when they're at the club, even when they're here visiting my, my brother and my sister in the Bay Area, they can answer the door, and anybody who they don't really know thinks there's somebody home. I can't tell you enough how important that is to keep break-ins from happening. Also, it's a good way for me to find out what my parents are doing because they like going out in the morning, and uh, if I don't get a mo motion notification, it means that uh, I should probably call them to find out what's going on. This is not just a gadget, folks. This is something that you're going to wonder how you did without. With Ring.com, you're always home. Now, try a device that everyone who has ever had it has fallen in love with. And right now, they've got so many other offerings. It's not just the Ring Video Door, but they may have started with that, but they've expanded their offerings into a ring of security. It, it allows you to, to keep a closer eye on all of your property. They've got uh, a pro kit that has a slim video doorbell with a crystal clear 1080p HD camera and night vision. And it's also hardwired so you don't have to worry about charging it. They've got a wireless and weatherproof HD stick-up cam that keeps an eye on other parts of your property and allows you to hear and speak to visitors with two-way talk. They've got a chime that you can plug in so that you can set a ringtone, <laughs> exactly a ringtone for your home when visitors come or when the motion sensor is set off. And of course, an illuminated solar security sign to deter users before they get to your door. But one of my favorite, favorite things that they've got right now is they're, they've got a, a new offering where you can have a neighbor, a neighborhood of rings so you can see events as they move from door to door to door. The Ring Video Doorbell and Stick-Up Cam installed in just minutes. Working together, they can provide 24-7 monitoring of your entire home, whether you're in the living room or thousands of miles away. Folks, you owe it to yourself to try our Ring Video Doorbell. Join the millions of homeowners who protect their home with Ring. For a limited time, know how listeners can get up to $150 off of one of the Ring of Security Kits. Just go to ring.com slash knowhow. That's ring.com slash knowhow. Make your smart house a smart home with Ring. And we thank Ring for their support of knowhow. Okay, let's get back to the action. So we've been talking about USB-C laptops, be it this or the uh, Swiss 7 that Brian has, or any of the new generation of laptops that are all including USB-C. You're going to have to live in a USB-C world. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds. Yes, there are a lot of dongles right now, but once we start seeing native peripherals, you're going to realize how much more convenient USB-C is over the, the old USB-A. Now, let's start with something that's really, really simple. You are going to need an adapter. You're going to need a way to connect your laptop, your desktop, whatever it might be that's USB-C enabled, to the, your old USB peripherals. The problem is, with only two ports and one of them required for charging, well, what happens? Do you break it out into a USB 3 hub? Do you break it out into a USB-C hub? How do you get all of the things connected to this while at the same time maintaining power, especially if you've got one of those devices that has only one USB-C port? Well, the simplest way to do it is to get one of these. We've got a link for this. This is an Acel USB-C adapter. Now, it's, it's actually relatively inexpensive if you realize that Apple's charging up to $80 for some of these. But uh, it's, it's a very simple device. It's got USB-C on one side and it's got USB-3 on the other, which will get you into your USB-C world. If that's how you're going to be plugging it into your, say, a USB-3 hub, that's perfectly the way to do it. But 
The added advantage is right on the side here. I don't, what, what, what's, uh, maybe this side one here. There we go. No, the other one. There we go. Right there. That's actually a USB-C charging port. What it allows me to do is to connect the charger that normally connects to my laptop and plug it into the side here. Now, again, because USB-C is reversible, I don't have to worry about which way I plug it in. And if I don't know if you've heard it, but my laptop just recognized both that it has a USB device connected to it and also that it's now being powered. This is a very inexpensive way, something uh, for, for you to keep charged and connected at the same time. Also a very good way for you to keep something in your bag that's going to guarantee that you always have a way to stay powered and you always have a way to co connect to those old USB uh, 3.0 uh, flash drives that you might want to use on your new laptop. So again, this is the Acel USB-C adapter, uh, USB-C to USB-A, also allows charging. You're going to find this for about $40 and below. That's pretty basic. And the reason why I use this cell is because I've had some really good luck with their peripherals in the past. They're pretty high quality. They're not the cheapest ones that you can find out there, but at least for the first year as these are rolling out, don't go for the super cheap ones because I've had some really bad experiences with them. All right, let's try something else. How about a person who doesn't want to go from this to a hub to all the peripherals? You're gonna need something a little bit different. What I would suggest is this, the peripheral with a really fun name. This is the Hutu. Uh, this is a, uh, a, well, they call it the Hutu shuttle. It's got 4K HDMI, it's got three USB 3 ports, it's got an SD card reader, and it's got a charging port, just like the Acel does, so I can keep charged and connected at the same time. This is gonna run you about $70, so it is more expensive, but what you get for that is everything in one. You get HDMI out right here, You've got your three USB ports right here. Actually, let's go to the side. Your three USB ports right here. And then the card reader. And everything, again, is with one single USB-C connection. If I plug this thing in right here. Oh, actually, I want to plug it in right there. Uh, I should probably turn the volume up. You, you see the connection. And even the, the Hutu lights, uh, lights up, which I can, hold on, wait. You know, it's the simple pleasures, folks, like having a little light-up USB things. Ooh, how about that? Oh. I did want a version that also had a network jack. I wanted Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet. Unfortunately, that kind of pumped the price up to 110. I'm not ready to go with that. I think eventually, give it three or four months, you're going to find some high-quality USB-C peripherals that will do all this. It will have the USB 3 ports. It will have a media card reader. It will have HDMI, maybe even DisplayPort. But I also want to see one that's got Ethernet because that really does give me a one-stop shop. That gives me an ability to have this one device hooked up to all my monitors, to my network, I plug in one cable and I'm good to go. I, that's kind of the dream when you're using an Ultrabook, to have that sort of ultra portability slash ultra flexibility. All right, so we've got the Hutu, which is gonna run you about $70, uh, but it's got a really short cable. And this, this is actually, okay, you're gonna wanna get yourself a couple of these because especially as we start off, you're gonna find out that your peripherals are often not close enough to the things that you need to connect them to. Get yourself a couple of these USB Type-C extension cables. Now this one I got for about $13. You could go on Monoprice and get a bunch of them for a lot less. Be careful though. Always look at the description because the longer a USB-C cable gets, the less data and power it can carry. It's, that's just, this is a simple electronic, simple uh, double E. If you have a really long cable, there's gonna be more resistance, more impedance in the wire, which means it's not gonna be able to de deliver as much current, which means you might not actually be able to charge the device you're connecting to. Also, the longer you get, the more possibility there is for crosstalk, for interference, which means you're gonna be dropping down your signal speed. So always look at the specs. If you want a long run, you wanna make sure it looks like this. If you go to the side view again there, Alex, uh, it's this heavy braid actually gives uh, a nice bit of insulation. They've got the, the super cheap ones that look like those old USB cables that you, you, you know, have a box full of. Don't get those. There's a reason why they're cheap. It's because when you plug them into your system, you're gonna see a degradation of your quality and uh, you're not gonna want that. But when you do get a nice one, it gives you the ability to take something like this to hide it away. Say, put it behind your monitor or behind your desk. Now you have just that one cable on your desktop and every time you come back to uh, your office or, or back to your home, you plug that in like, oh, like so. And now I've got connectivity to my screen. I've got connectivity to my network. I've got connectivity to my storage devices. And I'm charging my laptop. Very cool. Again, USB-C is a little bit expensive as we start off. But as the prices drop and as more and more products become available, 
you're going to see that it's, it's actually going to be something you're going to love. Uh, I, I'm a convert, although I don't have the money to spend on all the USB-C peripherals. Speaking of all the USB-C peripherals, if you've ever watched Know How, you know that one of my favorite gadgets, a gadget that I've held on to for two years, is that ASUS monitor. It's a USB monitor that it plugs in. It, it, it uses Display Link, which is a uh, USB to video adapter. It uses the processing power of your laptop to push video over USB, which then gets reassembled for your monitor. A tiny bit of lag, but overall, it means that you get a very easy to carry monitor. Mine weighs two pounds. Added to my laptop, it means I carry a five pound setup that has dual monitors, dual 1080p monitors, dual 15-inch monitors. It's beautiful, it's nice, it's elegant. Unfortunately, it's the old USB standard, and USB-C is not going to work really well with that. You could. You could use something like the Acel, or you could use the included dongles that Acer gives you to go from USB-C to USB-3, and then go from here to the monitor, but I, I found with that there's two problems. One. I've got a chain of cables, and I'm not a big fan of that. Two, and this is more important, there's still dropout because you're pushing so much data over that USB 3.0 bus, and it has to be converted from the USB-C bus, it doesn't like it. And every once in a while, it will unsync and momentarily disconnect and then reconnect. That's not really what I'm looking for. That kind of destroys the experience. So I was looking around the internet, finding, thinking maybe I could find a better adapter. Maybe there's something that, that handles that syncing a little bit better. I found that it wasn't the adapter I was looking for. It was a brand new version of the monitor. This is the exact same monitor as the one that I've been using. It's a, a Asus. It's a M169C+. Plus. Now this, the C, is for USB-C. You'll, you'll know if, you, if you've seen me uh, before with, with my monitor, this looks exactly the same. There are a couple more buttons and, and switches, but the only functional difference is this right here. If you, if you go to that other angle right there, if you go right there, that's, oh, I thought we had switched that to automatic focus. We did. No, it's, it's too dark. It just doesn't want to focus. So right there, that's a USB-C port. Now, what this gives me, is this gives me not Display Link. It's not a chipset that uses the internal processing power to push video over the USB bus. It's using the alternative mode. Now, this is something that you're going to hear a lot in USB-C. The alternative mode allows me to push different protocols over the connection. In this particular case, it's DisplayPort. And really, folks, it is DisplayPort. It's a DisplayPort connection that comes over USB-C, goes directly into the monitor, and then gives me a completely lag-free connection. In other words, it's not like I have to worry about there being a slight lag when I'm gaming. This is as if I have connected a DisplayPort monitor directly to the laptop. Let me show you how it works. Uh, so just like the other one, I've got a cable. I've got a way to, to stow it. This, this, uh, I'm not sure if this is an improvement on the old design. I kind of liked the old design, but you can fold this on itself, and it sort of becomes a stand for your monitor, just like so. Uh, you have three different choices. See, there's, there's three different uh, uh, rip-ups, or whatever they call these, stops. And you can choose either that angle, that angle, or that angle, depending on what you want. So I'm going to choose the most sleek, like so. And uh, the nice thing about USB-C is it doesn't matter which end you plug in, and they're both reversible, so yay. That makes it a lot easier. If I plug this in here, I cannot plug this into just any USB-C port. It has to be a USB-C port that has the alternative mode for display link. And again, let's, let's go to the side here. I don't know if it'll, it'll show it, but uh, right there. That one is standard USB. That one, with, because it has that little monitor icon, that means it's a display port uh, alternative. If I plug it in there, I will get both power and display port coming over the same cable. And then all I have to do is wait for this to turn on, and boom, I've got a monitor. Now, it's not touchscreen like the Spin 7, but I can put these in extended mode and put them side by side. Now, we will see some breakouts for this. You'll have the ability to, to use this on more than just USB-C computers. You will be able to use this on any adapter that does DisplayPort alternatives. So uh, if you're looking for a travel monitor, this one's really good. I also love the fact that I've got like brightness controls right on the monitor. That just that works so well. Look at that. Ooh. I'm so happy to have this one. 
Uh, now, if you go to the link for this, Alex, this is not cheap. This is going to run you close to $200. But if you've ever been traveling, and especially if you're traveling with one of the newer laptops that only has USB-C, I'd say that this is $200 well spent. Yeah, go figure. Treat yourself this, this holiday season. Uh, folks, we've got a special treat for you. Uh, you have seen Leo Laporte playing around with his service. And if you followed my Twitter account, you know that I recently updated his service because he was complaining that the rotating hard drive was just too slow. It was, just, it was slowing down all of his loading, all of his media. So I did something about that. But something else I've been working on is if there was a way, a way to create a Surface-like experience, something with a beautiful touchscreen, something that was very responsive, something that maybe cost half as much as a high-end Surface Pro, and yet gave you more flexibility and more functionality. Well, I did build that, and we're going to show it to you in the next episode of Know How, but it all starts with a monitor, specifically with a monitor that I took a look at three and a half years ago. This is the Acer T27HL. Take your monitor. Now stretch it. Add a bunch of ports, attach some speakers, slap a touchscreen on top of it, a sleek stand behind it, and shoehorn everything into a sexy 1.5 inch thick VESA mountable housing. That is the Acer T-Series of monitors. This model is the T27HL, a refinement of Acer's 7600U all-in-one line, but without the computer. It's a functional Microsoft Surface Studio, three years before the Surface Studio. It has the same general dimensions, the same unique adjustable leg, industrial design, see-through stand, and the ability to input multiple video and audio sources. Designed for those using Windows 8 and better, the T27HL is a 27-inch edge-to-edge touchscreen monitor featuring 1080p resolution, a 5 millisecond response time, and a 60 hertz refresh rate. Acer included HDMI, DVI, and VGA video inputs as well as a single upstream USB 3.0 port and three USB 3.0 downstream ports. Image quality is shockingly good, much better than what I would expect from a 1920 by 1080 display. The vertical alignment panel, the predecessor of IPS, gives the monitor a wide 178 degree by 178 degree viewing angle, and the LED backlight gives it acceptable brightness, good color, and dark blacks. The T27HL has a control panel to the right of the display that lets you control brightness, contrast, color temperature, and other monitor refinements, while also giving you control over volume and signal input. The response time is usable for even the most twitchy games, and the sound from the integrated speakers is good, but not great. There's power enough to fill a small room, but you'll probably want to connect to speakers with a bit more bass. Of course, the real story with the T27HL is the touchscreen. Driven by the USB 3.0 connection, the 10-point multi-touch sensor is smooth, fast, and nearly flawless. It interfaces with a variety of Windows 8 and Windows 10 laptops and desktops, and even with a Surface Pro. Each time the addition of a capable touchscreen made Windows less of a chore and more of a potentially interesting OS. More importantly, the T27HL and its 2K successor, the T27HLU, give you the ability to create a setup like a Surface Studio, but with your own laptop or desktop, potentially giving you a much more powerful workstation with most of the features of a Surface Studio for less than half the price. Now imagine that this is a three-year-old monitor. They actually have an updated version of this, the HUL, that uh, is a 2K screen. I think they're coming out with a 4K version. But the advantage of having a three-year-old screen is that this is $500. And it is about the same size as the Surface. Now the Surface does have a greater than 4K screen, so you're not going to be able to compare the resolution. But the functionality is pretty much there. We're going to be showing this to you in the next episode, but for example, here's a, an application that Leo likes to use. It's, it's the mapping application that you get inside of Windows 10. It, it's, it's actually a, a, a Microsoft Store app. Uh, what's the best way for me to show this off, Alex? Actually, if I do this, I should be able to switch to an aerial view. That's much better. And this monitor does have the ability to lay flat more like an easel like we would with, uh, with our drafting mode. But just like with Leo Studio, I get it's incredibly responsive display. Now, this is hooked up through the Hutu, uh, but uh, actually, yes, yeah, so you can see some of the pixelization because this is just a, a 1080p screen. Um, but it's amazingly responsive. 
uh, just going through a, a USB interface. Now let's bring up something else. You're going to see a little bit of jitter in the picture, but that's only because we're, we're doubling it so I can go through the HDMI. And Alex, if you go and show them the HDMI input on this, uh, it, this, is, this is the built-in 3D builder application that you have in Windows 10. Uh, but let's, let's, let's do, oh, I don't know. How about a train? Yeah, let's do the train. Uh, I, I can take this and just using two fingers and uh, rotate it, zoom in, zoom out, uh, rotate around it. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I, I really want to do. I, I think that this is where, like, where AR really comes into its own or VR. Oh, of course, every application is not going to lend itself to having this sort of functionality. Not every application is touch enabled. Not every application looks good on a touch screen. But the ones that do, really do. And the fact that I can just take this and stand it back up, and now it's an incredibly competent standard desktop monitor, that just that tickles me. It tickles me a lot. Now, here's going to the, the big thing. We're going to be building our, our Make a Studio with this Spin 7 because the USB-C uh, connectivity makes it just a natural selection. But I could pair this with my Predator desktop. I could pair this with the gaming machine I'm getting from uh, the Asus, one of the Republic of, Gra uh, of Gaming boxes. I could pair this with any powerhouse I want, which means that after a couple of years, I'm not going to be throwing away a ridiculous investment like you get with the Surface Studio, and instead I keep one of my biggest investment pieces, the monitor, year after year after year. If you want to know how to make your own studio, we're going to be giving you a tiny bit more in the next episode. And in a future episode of Know How, sometime in the new year, I'm actually going to show you my completed project. I'm going to be using this, the VESA mount in the back of the monitor to create something, a 3D printed part that's going to hold all the cables, all the adapters, all the, the power pieces that I need to make this thing go. In other words, I'm going to create for you a singular desktop system that allows you to have both a laptop and a desktop that act like a service, but give you the functionality of both for about half of the price of the high-end service, and probably with more of the performance. So look for that on a future episode of Know How. And hopefully in that future episode, we'll have Cranky Hippo back because you may have noticed the show's just not the same without him. I need my bro. I need my, uh, my hippo. It's just the way that we work here on Know How. Uh, the folks, show I, is out of control. Thank you, Brian. I know. See, Brian, Brian knows it himself. This, this is... This is uh, just not the same without the hippo. Uh, we know that this was a lot of information, and we want to make sure that you get all of the information you need to do the projects, what we've done on know-how, be it looking for a Spin 7 or buying the parts for your new USB-C device or maybe picking up one of these bad boys so you can start trying to make a Surface for yourself. If you want to do that, just go to our show notes page. It's also our show page at twit.tv. Slash KH. That's twit.tv slash know how. There you will find all of our episodes, including our back episodes. If you click the individual episodes, you'll actually see the show notes. These are derived from the docs that Brian and I use in order to run each of the shows. It's a, it's a better way than trying to you know, pause, replay, pause, replay. Instead, just go down and, and look at step by step, look at all the links for all the parts that we've had. And actually, in the next episode, where I'm going to be upgrading Leo's computer, I'm going to be having this step-by-step-by-step -step -step instructions. So if you've got a service and you're looking at upgrading your hard drive, why try to make it up on your own? I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. Also, if you want to find out what's going on in the Know It All community, that's what we call our folks on Google+, just go to Google+, and search for Know How. There is a short approval process because we want to keep out all the spam accounts, but once you're in, You'll be able to ask questions. You'll be able to post pictures of your projects, videos of your failures and your successes, and your stuff may end up on the show. Again, just go to Google Plus and look for Know How. Don't forget that you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Padre SJ, and uh, you can find Cranky Hippo at Cranky underscore Hippo. I'm going to... Thank you. There you go. He's, he's very quiet right now. He's contemplative. This, that's, that's what it is with Brian. And we have a third member of our crew. That's right... Uh, John. We have John? John Gummy. Uh, jo John something. We have John Cena as our TD, our director. Uh, you're going to find him at twitter.com slash AN. Excuse me, Padre. That's uh, Alex Gumpel. Yeah, no, that doesn't ring any bells. A-N-E-L-F-3. Thank you, Hippo. Thank you very much. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser, just saying that now you know how... Oh, that's it.